Jesus walked along the lonesome valley. Number 192. reading from the book of Genesis. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless, and I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face, and God said to him, Behold, my covenant is with you, and you shall be the father of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, 
but your name shall be Abraham, for I have made you the father of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful, and I will make nations of you, and kings shall come forth from you. And I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and your descendants after you. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarai your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah shall be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall come from her. verses 23 to 31. You who fear the Lord, praise Him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify Him. Stand in awe of Him, all you offspring of Israel. For He did not despise or abhor the affliction of the afflicted, he did not hide his face from me, but heard when I cried to him. From you comes my praise in the congregation. My vows I will pay before those who fear him. The poor shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before him, and dominion belongs to the Lord, and he rules over the nations. To him indeed shall all who sleep in the earth bow down. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, and I shall live for him. Posterity will serve him. Future generations will be told about the Lord, and proclaim his deliverance to a people yet unborn, saying that he has done it.
As we walk through this journey of Lent, and this season of Lent, we find ourselves in the book of John 3 today. We find ourselves where Jesus is encountered in the evening. We find ourselves by this man by the name of Nicodemus. My sermon topic today is Jesus meets you where you walk. The thing must be born again. The text reads that there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who comes from God. For one could, no one could perform the miracle signs you were doing if God were not with him. And Jesus replied, declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again. How can a man be born when he is old, Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born. Jesus answered him, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asks. Just for a few moments, I want to speak to you from the topic, Jesus meets you where you are. In short, Nicodemus, a Pharisee. Nicodemus, a great teacher. Nicodemus is a man who has great influence in the council. Nicodemus is a man who has watched over a period of time Jesus' healings, Jesus' message, Jesus feeding the blind, I mean feeding the poor, Pharisee of all Pharisees. Yet Jesus meets him right where he's at. Nicodemus doesn't confront Jesus in the daytime. Nicodemus does not confront Jesus in the synagogue. Nicodemus does not confront him just walking and having lunch. Nicodemus comes to Jesus in the night. And he comes to him in the night, if we all might think or know, is because he wants to ask the question. Nicodemus also does not want to be seen by him. But yet, yet, Nicodemus wants to know you are a great teacher, Rabbi. Nicodemus was one of the few in the Pharisees and Sadducees who called Jesus a rabbi. Many Pharisees and Sadducees saw Jesus as a fake. Many of them believed that how can this earthly man, the son of Joseph and Mary, this ordinary carpenter, be somebody who is so calls himself the Messiah? If you look at this text, and you look at this perspective, it makes you question and wonder, why did Jesus meet him where he was? Why does Jesus meet us where we are? Yet Nicodemus comes to him and asks the question. Jesus then gives him an answer. Jesus says, tell Nicodemus, flesh gives birth to flesh. Adam and Eve, male and female. My brothers and sisters, many of us know how we come into the earth. We come to the earth for a birth canal. We come to the earth for we're protected in water, right? And yet we find Jesus telling him that every human being is born by water. Now, to understand this even further, even today when we see how perhaps we can't have children in the ordinary way. A child still has to be placed in the womb 
of a woman and go through the process of the, the purification and the process of being born through water. So Jesus is giving Nicodemus the birth, the earthly way in which we come into the world. But now Jesus is talking about a new way, a new direction, a new way. So Jesus gives this illustration. But in that part of the illustration, the born again is connected to what Adam did and what Jesus must do. The Lenten season represents a time where we're going through a journey of 40 days, understanding the journey of Jesus going to the cross, understanding how salvation is about to be born, going from an old covenant to a new covenant. Nicodemus asks the question. Nicodemus, a rich man. Nicodemus, a very studied man, but still has this lingering question. And part of that lingering question for Nicodemus, as it might be for us, is that we might have everything in front of us. We may have a good job. We may have good health. We may have children that are not acting up. We may have a job that we like, an absent job we don't like. But we still have that question of fulfillment. And Nicodemus finds himself coming to the rabbi, Jesus, to kind of find out, what else is there? What else is there, Jesus? That's really the question. What else is there for me? And Jesus says, you must be born again. So Nicodemus being, just asks the question, how can a human being go back into their mother's womb again? again Nicodemus is looking at it from our earthly perspective. Nicodemus is looking at it from how we see things, from a visual perspective. But what I would suggest to you in this text, and I would suggest to you in your life, when we look at God, we must look at God and people from spiritual eyes. We can't look at God, we can't look at people the way sometimes people look at each other. If we're ever going to make a difference in the world that we're living in, if we're ever going to make a difference in our lives, we have to begin to see people the way God sees people. But you might say to me, Reverend Rogers, I'm not Jesus. You're right. You're not Jesus, nor am I. But we're still charged with looking at people the way God looks at people. We must meet people where they are, as God meets us where we are. And that's what we find in this text. He meets Jesus right where he's at. Nicodemus is scared. Many people say that Nicodemus is a coward. Why don't you meet Jesus and challenge him with that question among the Pharisees and Sadducees? Nicodemus understood that this was a good man. Nicodemus understood that this man named Jesus did things that no human being he had ever seen do. But he still had that question. And even with us, when we want to do things and we don't have the courage to do it, Jesus will meet you where you are. And so we find Nicodemus in that moment going to Jesus. My brothers and sisters, the gospel message is simple. I'm convinced the gospel message is simple. Jesus tells us in John 3.16, he goes further on in this text, he says, For God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten Son, for whomsoever believed in him should not perish but have everlasting life. But at times, with our earthly vision and our earthly eyes and our earthly systems, we complicate the gospel. We complicate the gospel by telling people that you got to do this in church. We complicate the gospel by saying you got to do that and this and that. But Jesus makes it clear. And so I ask the question, what does it mean to be born again? As I studied and went over this text over the week and meditated on it, what does it mean to be born again? So if I took just a few moments to give you my own, just a few personal perspective of my transparency where I'm at. I can remember growing up in church at 11 years old, giving my life to Christ at 11. I can remember being baptized in a Baptist church. And in a Baptist church, you give your life to Christ and then you go to a Baptist. Because then, of course, they say you are, at that age, 11, 12, 13, like the Jewish faith said, at 13 you are accountable to God. 
So that's what kind of happened to me, my brother, and my sister. I think me and my brother might have understood what we were doing, but I'm not sure if my sister understood. She was more or less like about eight or nine. No, actually she was seven, I was 11. I remember the Sunday night. I remember laying in the bed the Saturday, giving my life to Christ, and saying I wanted to accept Jesus Christ in my life, and I, I wanted to be a good person and a good boy. I wanted to do everything right. I, I, wanted to, I wanted to not do the things that I saw going on in my community, even in my own home. Then I got baptized. So I had that process of, you know, being the water purification and being a new person. So I thought. Uh, so I thought. Then as I went to high school, tried to be good, couldn't be good. <laughs> went to high college, tried to be good, couldn't be good. Got married, tried to be good. Most of the time was good, but people keep me in line. <laughs> One laugh, I got laugh, 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 okay. <laughs> good. But I say that to say, I think it was for me in the early, late 90s, chasing money, looking at human beings, looking at what they had and what I didn't have, wanting my kids to have the best, being envious of what other people had. And something came in my life for the first time when I began to say, for God I will live and for God I will die. I'm going to walk towards the path of loving other people. I'm going to walk towards the path of reading the Bible. I'm going to walk towards the path of trying to do the right thing. That's when I began to realize what being born of the Spirit meant. It meant that I was going to live a life, not a perfect life, but a life bent in the area and direction of God. Bent in an area that I said that I was going to do right by people. I was going to do right by serving God. Now the problem with that is sometimes when we get on this spiritual high and we're reading the Bible and quoting scripture to everybody, to your wife and your kids, Listening to Charles, waking up every morning to Charles Stanley and going to bed with Charles Stanley as one of my theologians. You can get so heaven bound that you can come no earthly good. And so as I began to process that and write it in journals, and I probably got about 70, 80 journals, got probably close to 100 journals that I've written in over the last almost 25 years of prayers of friends and, and, and requests to, from God and struggles that I've gone through personally, physically, mentally, and struggles. But it was something about that born again born. I'm coming back to the text, y'all. You know I'm going to give you the story. But it's something about that born again that I began to realize that I, I needed to live a different life. And so it was that time when I began to see reading the Bible gave me spiritual muscles. Reading the Bible writing in a journal, taught me how to treat my wife, taught me how to take a step back with my children, taught me not to judge people, taught me to have mercy, grace. One of my favorite scriptures in the Bible, and I always quote it, is Micah 6, 8. It says, O mortal, I have shown you what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? Do justice, love mercy, and walk humbly before your God. That's my favorite scripture. Because when I do justice, people are treated fair. When I give people mercy who don't deserve it, I'm a better for it. And when I walk humbly before God, you and I can live better. You and I can do the right thing. You and I can really be used by God. Show me a prideful person. Show me a puffed up person. And I show you a person who's going to fall very quickly. But show me a humble person. Show me a person who can see the other side. Show me a person who has mercy. Show me a person who has grace. And they imitate Jesus. Back to the story. Here Jesus is now in front of Nicodemus. And the fact is this. It's Nicodemus' intelligence, his intellect, his wealth that is getting in the way of understanding what it means to be born again. Paul said, Now concerning things offered unto idols, we know that we all have knowledge. Every one of us in this room have knowledge. But knowledge puffs up, yet love builds up. We live in a society.
society, my brothers and sisters, that we're more concerned with our means, our education, our status, who we know, who we don't want to know, who we hang out with, who we refuse to hang out with. We're more concerned about that than we are the souls and the lives of people. So we find in this text that Nicodemus finds himself in a very peculiar situation. But Jesus doesn't hold back on you. Jesus will meet you where you are. Jesus meets Nicodemus where he is. Jesus tells him and says, you must be born of the Spirit. Jesus is telling Nicodemus this because Jesus wants Nicodemus to understand that I am here for the new journey. I am here for the new covenant. I am here for the new way of life. Nicodemus, you know the old way. You are a scholar. You know the Old Testament. You know what our foreparents said, but I came to fulfill the new, the old covenant. And that's the purpose of Lent. That's this journey. This journey speaks of being born of the Spirit. The story I gave you was a time in my life when I became, I was born with the Spirit. The way I saw God and the way God saw me, it was an intimate relationship. I could tell him everything and understood everything. And even though I didn't understand it, God understood. For the first time, I stopped playing church and I began to have a relationship. Nicodemus is playing church, my brothers and sisters. Jesus is trying to tell them it's bigger than church. It's about a relationship. And so we find Jesus in that space with Nicodemus, and he meets him right where he is. Jesus even gives him the analogy. The wind blows wherever it pleases, yet you hear it sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it goes. It's the same thing with us right now. Every one of us, even with our masks on, we're breathing. You might, I don't know if you can feel the air. I know you can't see it. But we're breathing. Does air exist? Yes. Does wind exist? Yes. Do we see it? No. And Jesus is telling Nicodemus, to move from religion to relationship. That's what the Lenten season is about. It's about relationship. This combination of purification of our hearts and transformation in our lives can only come through the Holy Spirit. Now, if you have ever been in a Pentecostal church, if you've ever heard of speaking in tongues, people would say that when people spoke in tongues, that that was the birth of the Holy Spirit. I would suggest to you otherwise. I would suggest to you that the birth of the Holy Spirit is when God comes in your life and God is controlling your life and directing your footsteps. And even though you might stumble here or there, God is there. You begin to know that, and I've told people who struggle with past sins in their lives, who struggle with past disappointments in their lives. I, I, I told people that no Christian, no true believer should ever feel guilt. They said, well, what do you mean I shouldn't feel guilty? You shouldn't feel guilty. You should feel convicted. See, when I make a mistake, I'm convicted by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit says, go and make it right with that employee. Go and make it right with me. Go and make it right with um, the children. This morning, for example, I just thought, shout out to me and see was got an argument. But the Holy Spirit was, in, had, was smart enough to say, let's take a quick ride. And I said, I'm sorry. See, that's the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't have to win. You, you don't have to win with the Holy The Holy Spirit will take over. And then you will be convicted and say, eh, I shouldn't have did that. I need to go and apologize. I should have did that. Should have had that. And so that's what Jesus is speaking about on this journey. That Jesus is speaking to Nicodemus about 
I'll meet you, Nicodemus, where you are. But even when I meet you there, Nicodemus, I'm not going to leave you there. There's a two-part to the, I'll meet you where you are. Jesus will meet us right where we are, but he loves us too much to leave us where we are. Jesus loves us so much that he will move you beyond where you are in your life and move you to understand that you are better than that. I have a young man that I talk to every morning. He's in college. I talk to two of our gentlemen every Saturday morning. And I'm always reminding them, let us not go back to where we were. Let's go forward. Yes, we regret what we've done. But the only way you're going to grow, the only way you're going to make a difference in the kingdom, and the only way you can make a difference in the lives of others is recognizing where you are and letting Jesus move you further. That's what, Nick, that's what Jesus was doing with Nicodemus. He said, that's okay, it's okay to leave. And guess what, Nicodemus? And this is what I love about Jesus. Because when you read further on in the story, not only does Nicodemus buy the myrrh for Jesus' burial, but they bury him in Nicodemus' one of Nicodemus' tombs. See, Nicodemus went from religion to relationship, to serving Jesus Christ. So that's when he'll meet you. See, he'll meet you where you are, but he loves you too much and has too much for you to leave you right where you are. So he moves Nicodemus where you are. So I conclude with this story. A few years ago, I listened to a gentleman who was what we call a pimp. And he talked about how he made so much money with women. But it was a street preacher who handed him a tract. And the tract basically talked about what it means to be born again. And the man looked it over and looked it over and looked it over and looked it over. And within weeks, in fact, days, this whole man's life got turned upside down. And in the upside down, he talked about how that track of being born again changed his life. He went from a life of sin, a life of hurting other human beings to a life of not only becoming a Christian, but also now preaching and teaching the word of God. You see, Jesus will meet you even as a pimp, even as a prostitute, even as a hate mom, even as a thief. Jesus will meet you right where you are. But again, he'll move you beyond where you are. And that's the gospel message, brothers and sisters. That's what we got to remind you. I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. That's the message. Nobody, and I mean no human being on this earth, is beneath the cross of Jesus Christ. That's the good news. That's the good news. That's what Jesus wanted to tell Nicodemus. The good news is this. When you're born again, Nicodemus, when the Pharisees and Sadducees are born again, when the people who are blind and now they see when they're born again, they'll live a new life. They'll be a new person. And that's the hope we have, brothers and sisters in Christ. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. On Christ, the solid rock I stand, all the ground is sinking sand. And that's the news, that's the good news in this living season. That the good news is that Jesus is that new way. Amen.
I am afraid the summons number 317 in your hand.
Let's recite the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, our be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil.
to meet you right where you are. Just give him that hand, and he'll be right there. And to the God who lets you keep you from stone, and to present his glorious presence without fault and the testament of great joy. To the only God, our Savior, by glory, majesty, power, and authority, in Jesus Christ our Lord. And before all ages, now and forevermore. And the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.